Chapter 2 First Steps into the Jungle The slide was greased. I was starting my long plunge to the very bottom of the grim pit. I guess my trip downward really was cinched when I met a petty hustler who was very likable, and we became pals. My hustler pal was called Party Time. By the time he was 23, he had done four bits in the joint. On each fall, he had been jacked up for either strong-arm robbery or till-tapping. He got his moniker hung on him because as soon as he scored for scratch, he would make fast tracks to the nearest underworld bar. When he got inside the door, he would shout, All right, you poor-ass bastards, it's party time, and Joe Evans is in port with enough scratch to burn up a wet elephant. All you studs stop playing stink finger with these long cock whores, and everybody belly up to the log and get twisted on me. His flat African features were pasted to a skull that could have belonged to a caveman. He was short, powerful, and shiny black. He was ugly enough to break daylight with his fist but for some curious reason, he was irresistible to many of the thrill-seeking white women who sneaked into the black side of town, panting as they chased after that hoary myth. Nigger men do it so good, it thrills you to your toenails. There was a fast sheet joint with the trick rooms in the rear, right on the alley. I was peeping one night into one through a frayed shade when I saw a party time for the first time. My eyes were bugging when I saw the tall Viking-type white man, his tiny but voluptuous female white companion, and party time taking their clothes off. Finally, they stood there, naked. I could see their lips moving, so I pressed my ear and eyes sidewise against the window that was open a couple of inches at the top to get the sound. The white joker was tenderly hefting party time's weapon into his hand like maybe it was Ming Dynasty pottery he said excitedly to the broad. Oh, honey, can you believe the size, the beauty of it? In the glow of the room's red light, that broad looked like an animated portrait by da Vinci. Her eyes were blue fire in her passion. She purred like a Persian kitten and pounced onto the bed. Party time stood at the side of the bed looking down at her. He was an ebony executioner. His horizontal axe cast a cruel shadow across the snowy peaks, rose-tipped. My trouser front was tented as I pressed even tighter against the window. I had never seen anything like this back in Rockford. Then, to my amazed ears, the white man said a strange thing as he pulled a chair to the end of the bed and sat on the very edge of it. He was breathing hard when he said, all right now, boy. Stab it into her. Hurt her. Punish her. Crucify her. Good boy. Good boy. The broad looked so fragile and helpless to my naive eyes that I felt a pang of pity pulse inside me as she moaned and whimpered in painful pleasure beneath the black demon, savagely pile-driving between the jerky white legs, jackknifed, imprisoned behind the sweating, hunching black shoulders. Like he was trying to make a home, party time was asking in a hoarse voice over and over, Beautiful bitch, is it good? Beautiful bitch, is it good? The white man was an odd, funny sight as he raced around the arena like a demented Caesar, cheering on his merciless black gladiator. Finally, when the show was over and they started to dress, I went to the front and sat on a stoop next to the joint. I wanted to get a close-up of the freaks. When they got to the sidewalk in their street clothes, they were disappointingly normal. Just a clean-cut white couple having a parting chat with a grinning black negro. The mixed-up couple went down the sidewalk away from me. Party time came toward me. He didn't notice me sitting on the stoop. I was itching with curiosity, so I hit on him. When he came abreast, it startled him. His face got stiff. I said, Hey, Jack, how you doing? 
That sure is a fine silk girl, huh? You got a square to spare? He fished a cigarette from his red shirt pocket, handed it to me, and said, Yeah, kid. She's fine as a valentine. Two sights I ain't never seen, and that is a pretty bulldog and an ugly white woman. He was spouting cliches, but to a small-town boy he came off witty as hell. I was in that brain-picking mood, so I put the snow machine into high gear to hold him. My eyes bucked in mock awe as I lit the square. I said, Thanks, man, for the square. Christ, that's a sporty vine you got on. I wish I could dress like you. You sure are clean aplenty. He took the bait like a rapist in a nudist colony for the blind. He flopped down on the stoop beside me. He poked his chest out, his eyes flashing like a pinball machine gone haywire as he got ready to open up. He hiked the pants legs of his green check suit to his calves to show his blood-red socks. The huge zircon on his right pinky glittered under the street lamp as he cracked his knuckles and said, Kid, my name is Party Time, and I am the best flat-footed hustler in town. Money loves me and can't stay away from me. You see that fine silk broad? I got a double saw to lay her. Of course, that ain't nothing. It happens all the time. I could be one of the greatest pimps in the country if I was lazy, and I didn't have so much good hustling in me. I sat there listening to his bullshit until 2 a.m. He was likable, and I was hungry for a pal. He was an orphan, and he had just done a two-year bit straight up, his fourth two months before. He had a head full of wild, risky hustles he wanted to try. He needed a partner. He tried all of them on size for me. I got home at 2.20. About one minute later, I heard Mama's key in the door. She had served a banquet for her white folks. I just made it into bed with all my clothes on when she came to look in on me. I was snoring like a drunk with a sick sinus when she kissed me goodnight. I lay thinking in the darkness until daybreak, putting myself into and trying to size myself into one of those quick buck schemes that party had plotted. When the sun came up fat and bright, I knew I would give the party's version of the Murphy a whirl. I didn't know his version was crude and dangerous, and only a weak imitation of the real Murphy. Years later, I discovered that the Murphy, when played by experts, was a smooth, short con game with a slight risk. In any section where Negro whores operate, white men will flock to trick with them. I met Party several times after school at a pool room. He ran my roll down to me, and the next Friday night we got down with our hustle. Mama was serving a party, so I could stay in the streets until at least 1 a.m. Around 10 that night in an alley in the heart of the vice section, 7th and Bleach Streets. We unwrapped the package that party had brought. I rolled up my pants legs beyond my bony knees. I slipped into the 25-cent red cotton dress from the Salvation Army. I put on the frayed red satin high-heeled shoes. I pinned a scraggly piece of hair just inside the front inner band of the faded blue straw bonnet. When I tilted it on my head at a sexy angle, the ringlets of uneven hair hung down over my eyes like bangs. I stood wide-legged, flexed my thigh and hip muscles against the tight red dress, aping the horse stance. Party looked me over head to toe. I was wondering how I came off as a broad. He shook his head, hunched his shoulders, and walked toward the mouth of the alley to catch a sucker. I got the answer when he reached the sidewalk. He twisted his bead toward me and said, Listen, man, stay out of the light, okay? Within five minutes, he gave me the office that some action was coming down the street. I watched Party giving the pitch to a short elderly white man. I wonder if I had enough voltage as a broad to come through with my end of the deal. He officed my flash cue an instant before the white man peeked up 
the alley at me. I jerked my skinny ass in a series of bumps and grinds and hopefully waved him toward me. That skinny black bitch he saw must have lit a fire in him all right. He fumbled his hide from his hip pocket and handed a bill to party. The chump started up the alley at a hell of a pace for an old bastard. He had paid his money, and he was red hot to take his chance to stick that hot nigga bitch waiting for him in the shadows. He had no chance, but in a way he was lucky. Lucky that his hide had not been fat with greenbacks. If he had been loaded, when I evaporated through the gangway, party, instead of fading away, would have come into the dark alley behind the sucker and robbed him with brute force. My heart was pounding in excitement as I galloped through the alleys towards our next prearranged duck blind. I took a new station several blocks away. Party time came moments later. Looked up the alley and hooked the tips of his thumb and index fingers into an all is well O. Oh. We beat several other suckers. None had the fare for the strong arm. We worked until 12.30. Then, unlike Cinderella, I stashed my mildewed costume, got my half of the $70 take, and raced home. Mama came in a half hour after I did. As in all other things, there are many Murphys. Real Murphy players use great finesse to separate a mark from a scratch. The most adept of them prefer that a trick hit on them. It puts the Murphy player in a position to force the sucker to qualify himself and to trim the mark not only for all his scratch but his jewelry as well when approached and quizzed by a mark as to where a girl can be found the murphy man will say look buddy i know a fabulous house not more than two blocks away brother you ain't never seen more beautiful freakier broads than are in that house one of them, the prettiest one, can do more with a swipe than a monkey can do with a banana. She's like a rubber doll. She can take a hundred positions. At this point, the sucker is wild to get to this house of pure joy. He entreats the con player to take him there, not just direct him to it. The Murphy player will prat him to enhance his desire. He will say, Man, don't be offended. But Aunt Kate that runs the house don't have nothing but high-class white men coming to her place. No niggas or poor white trash. You know, doctors, lawyers, big-shot politicians. You look like a clean-cut white man, but you ain't in that league, are you? At this pricking of his ego, the mark is ready for the hook. He will protest his worth as a person and his right to go where any other son of a bitch can go. Hell, for a high-class lay, a double saw wouldn't phase him. Few can resist the charm of exclusivity in its myriad forms. The con player, still hedging, shoring up firmly the convincer, will then say, Man, I believe you, and everything you say is true as gospel. In fact, I like you, pal, but try to see my side of it. First, to show you I trust you, I'll tell you a secret. I've been working for Aunt Kate's house for many years now as her outside man, you know, making sure only nice dates went up there. Aunt Kate and I got an airtight system. Friend, I know you will help me keep Aunt Kate's rules, so let's go. I am taking you to the thrill of your life. While keeping up an inflaming description of the whores and sexual delights to be found only in Aunt Kate's, the Murphy player had steered the sucker to a pre-chosen, neat, attractive apartment building. In the foyer, in a subtle but compelling manner, the con player nudged the mark into a fast meeting of minds, the question agreed upon. As hot as he was, he couldn't go up before he checked in all valuables. It was Aunt Kate's unshakable rule. Aunt Kate was rock right never to tempt or trust a whore. Only fools trusted whores, right? 